What's up, online people? Thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're here. You need me too. We all need it. I know that everybody's coming from somewhere. Oh, hey, two waters. Dope. Uh, everybody's coming from somewhere. Everybody is coming from somewhere they didn't like or they're on their way to a place that they're not going to like. And that's the reality for all of us. And so I want to be very tender today. I want to be uh, gentle. Sometimes when we have meaty stuff, it's a little, chunk, little chunkier, a little chewier. And I want you to know that Jesus is happy to see you. Um, Jesus is always sensitive to your pain. But I want to challenge you to be careful how you hear, okay? There's a, it's rare that there's a message where every single thing that is said is for everybody. More of the time, we need the Holy Spirit's help to discern what is for us in a particular message and what is something like, ah, oh, that's probably for somebody else. There might be a lot of that. I find the, the, the meatier the message, the more people kind of have to pay attention to what's for them and what's maybe for somebody else because somebody's being challenged in a way that you might not be being challenged. I can remember years ago, I'm driving home from the hospital. My sister had been in a horrible car accident. She was in a coma. She was on a respirator. Two of her friends had died. And it was bad. It was bad news. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if she'd ever really come back to herself again, ever. And I'm driving home, and the Spirit of God whispers to me. And he whispers a song that was like a song that was a little bit popular then from Vineyard. It says, come, now is the time to worship. And I'm driving home, my heart is breaking in half, because I'm like, I don't know if my little sister is going to really, you know, ever get married, have kids. I don't know any, any of this. And the Spirit of God is saying, come, now is the time to worship. And I had been taught by my leaders and pastors that, yeah, in the moment of hardship, that's when you worship. That's when you decide to put your praise on. That's when you decide, I'm going to show every devil in hell that God, my God is still worthy no matter what is happening. And it was hard to do, but I began to sing in my soul. God, you are good all the time, no matter what. I trust you no matter what you do. Uh, you're going to find Jesus that I really want to be close to you. And if that means I've got to worship you through this, then I will do it. That's a hard thing to do. So I don't want to push you over that ledge until you're ready to go. But let's go to the book of Isaiah real quick. We're going to start here. It's Isaiah 55. The people of God are in bondage. They're in a land that is not their own. And the prophet of God is coming to them and saying, hey guys, just so you know, I know that this is really hard right now, but I got good things coming and you can count on it. It says in verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace and the mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. That's kind of a little bit weird, but let's just break it down. He's saying, hey guys, my word, my word is a special thing, and I send it forth, and anytime I send it forth, it accomplishes what I want it to do. And many of us have heard that, and we're, we never ask the question, what? What does he want it to do? What is this? It's supposed to not return void. What is it going to do? And he says, it, it results in like the rain, the rain waters the grain and the food, and it helps people collect it and make food for themselves. Because it's my words like that. It comes and it, it creates spiritual food and health for everybody, no matter how hard of a situation that they're in. But it's even beyond that, because after that, he talks about you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Okay, so that's the food of God's word, giving us joy and peace, even in the midst of being in temporary discipline, this is the mountains and hills will burst forth into song. Now, mountains and hills don't typically burst forth into song. And yet Jesus said, hey, man, if these kids stop, even the very rocks are going to cry out. Because all of creation, ultimately, its end is to worship God. And so God is saying, hey, when I send forth my word, here's what it results in. The word of God goes and it feeds souls, but it turns into not, it's not, not just to feed you. It's to turn captives into worshipers. The ultimate end of God's word should be worship. The ultimate thing that God is after, he wants to take people that are in captivity. And he says, I want to bring you out of that and I want to turn you into worshipers. This is why the very thing that he told Pharaoh, many of you remember Old Testament Pharaoh, he sends Moses to tell Pharaoh and he says something very kind of neat. He says, go to Pharaoh and say to him, Exodus 8.1, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so they may worship me. 
Let my people go so that they may worship me. Now, that's not just sing songs. They weren't just to, to go out and do ritualistic things. Worship is not just that. Worship is everything we do to obey and give glory to God, to live in such a way that we say, we are your thing, and you deserve all the praise from our life. So here's what we're going to say. God sends his word to turn captives into worshipers. God sends his word to turn captives <clears throat> into worshipers. What is God trying to do with us? If he's sending his word to us, well, he's trying to turn us into worshipers and we're to actually be carriers of his word to everybody else. And everybody's in captivity to one degree or another. Have you noticed this? Like, even though you're here right now, and even though probably many of you, you would consider yourself a spiritual person, maybe you love Jesus, and this is kind of how you roll. Even so, at the end of the day, my friend, we're in major captivity to the gods of this age, to, 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 the, to the media, to all the games that our spiritual enemy plays. Where our, our minds are so distracted a lot of the time from worshiping God because we're just doing all the things, man. We're online and we're in the social media thing and we're watching our stuff and we're trying to up the ladder at work and we're trying to get where we're going and I'm trying to collect as much as I can and pile it up and say, oh, there it is and now I'm significant and we're trying to play all these games and the Bible says, yeah, I mean, a lot of those are just false gods. A lot of that is just you wrapped up in the world's system and God wants us all freer and freer from that very thing. All of us have a heart. It's to varying degrees. Now, now you know people, see, see, you know this is true because you know people that are, you are freer than them. Like you can think of them right now. You can think of people in your life and you're like, oh, thank God I'm not like them. And, and it's probably true. They, they are more wrapped up than you are, but there's probably also, honestly, some other people that look at you and they're like, oh God, thank God I'm not as wrapped up as they are. So we're all, let's all own it together. We're all in a version of ca captivity. Every place we believe something other than what God says, we're, we're wrapped up, we're, we're captive. What's, what's, what's the answer? What's the solution? What should we do about this? It, you're not gonna believe it, okay? The answer is the church. I know some of you are like, nope, that's not it. Immediately when I said that, you're like, that can't be true. There's no way that that's true. And I get you. I understand. Part of us says, that can't be right because I've seen the church do a lot of stuff wrong over the centuries. And that is true. But in every case, that was some way where the people of God were trying to maybe obey God in some areas, but they were not obeying him in other areas. And because they weren't obeying him in those other areas, all kinds of hell breaks loose. But nevertheless, Jesus stays firm to his bride. He stays committed to her. And he says, yeah, nevertheless, they're the carriers of my word. And it's my word that releases the captives. So their job is to go into all the earth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. This is the way we say it here. We say fierce exists to develop prevailing followers of Christ who walk with him step by step. But I want to change it at least just for today. Fierce exists to turn captives into worshipers of Christ who walk with him step by step. Captives into worshipers. What are we trying to do? Hey, what are we trying to do, fierce? What are we doing? We're trying to turn captives into worshipers. That's the whole game. That's the whole reason we're here. That's why we're still on planet earth because there's other captives, more captive than we are, and we're trying to help them. Okay, you help me and I'll help them. And we'll just all help at one another. And it all results from a meeting that happened. A meeting where the son of God came to earth and he met the humans. He said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna fellowship with you. You're gonna see what I'm like. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no one's ever gonna say that I don't know what you're like. And then I'm gonna allow you to put me to death so I can go to another meeting, my meeting with the heavenly father. I'm gonna meet him and I'm gonna take your hand. I'm gonna put the hands of mankind in the hands of the heavenly father. I'm gonna say, okay, this is reconciled now. Now y'all are in a meeting. Y'all are together. What are we trying to do, church? That's what Jesus did for us. What we're trying to do is go to every other captive and say, let me take your hand and put it in God's hand because God wants a meeting. That's what God's after. He wants a meeting. He doesn't want just church. He doesn't want just services. He doesn't want us to do this, that, and the other thing if we're not in a meeting with him. His heart is for his creatures and he wants our heart to become for his. So that's why we're talking about ownership today. Now, when we say ownership, we don't mean, we talk about ownership like church membership. We don't mean ownership in the sense of like you own your car. You don't get to own the church in that sense at the end of this day. We're talking about ownership in the sense of like, I'm owning this on my team that we're gonna win because I'm here and I'm taking responsibility for it. I'm gonna win. 
If you think about everybody, every NFL player this year, none of them were like, I don't really care if we go to the Super Bowl. Like if they were like that, they wouldn't make the team, right? Everybody's gotta be like, I'm owning this. Okay, win or lose, this is on me. I'm, I'm ready, this is my team, this is my season. And that's what owners of fear say. They say, this is my church, this is my mission. It's on me. I'm the one who's gonna take the hand of the captives and bring it to the hand of the Son of God so they turn into worshipers. It's my job, it's not anyone else's job, it's my job. And so we talk about it like going all in and, and where the rubber meets the road here, because we can all say that. I mean, oh, yeah, that sounds good. But what it really comes down to is priorities because we've all got priorities and we've all got really the same amount of time. And you've all got, you've all got, I'll bet, I'll bet you this is true. Everybody watching right now, you've got more to do than you could do. There's, you, you could fill up everything and you'd still have more left over. And so that's why we create priorities because, okay, here's all the things that, this is priority number one, this is definitely gonna get done. Priority number two, okay, hopefully this will get done. Priority number three, we might even just chuck this all together because all I've got time for is to do these. And so one of the things that the son of God does is he comes into our lives to really teach us the ways of Jesus. He says, I want to be your mentoring friend. I wanna be the one that teaches you what your priorities are supposed to be. And if you'll follow my priorities, you will find that you keep turning captives into worshipers. Just like I turned you into one, you're gonna turn other people into one. But it's all about priorities. It's all about us getting our priorities straight and he'll turn captives through our church into worshipers. Little asterisk right here. Everything I'm about to say about priorities, this presupposes that one has genuinely encountered Jesus Christ and lovingly surrendered to him and in gratefulness are now trying to rock his priorities versus trying to do these priorities in order to curtail his favor. You, can, you can't get his favor. All you can do is receive his favor. All you can do is gratefully ask Jesus, will you please forgive me? And then he does, he loves to. And he says, none of your religious stuff is gonna work anyway. That's fine as a response to me, but it's not a thing you can do in order to get my favor. So assuming that has already happened, if that's already happened, this is for you. This is your message. If that hasn't happened yet, Baby, you can just sit back. You can just enjoy this because really you're not on the line to do any of this because your first stop is to get your hand into Jesus' hand. And that is only by grace through faith. That's not something you can do for him. That's something you've got to accept he's done for you. And everything else we do here, we do in gratefulness. And really everything else we do here in gratefulness, these priorities are the worship. Remember, the Israelites came out and they came out to worship. These priorities are the worship. Everybody hearing that? Okay, so when we go through all six of these, the ones that you are crushing, I need to hear some real loud amens. Now, the ones that you're not doing so well, you're probably best off just to say amen really loud anyway. That way, no one will know that you're struggling with that one, okay? So, six commitments of an owner. Number one, praying for and inviting people to church. Praying for, thanks, he's got me, man. I heard some grumbles, amen, amen, yeah. <laughs> Some of you aren't so sure, but some, okay. Praying for and inviting people to church. So Philip had recently met Jesus and he's so excited about it. He's, he's, he's becoming a worshiper. Now he met Jesus and he goes and finds his friend, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, he's like a lot of us would be. He's a little bit speculative. He's like, I don't know, man. And Nathaniel, you know, he, he says to him, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I love Philip. He just says, come and see. He didn't, he didn't try to like explain it. He doesn't try to, uh, defend Jesus' credentials. Nathaniel's like, man, I don't know. That's, a, that's like a podunk hick town. I don't think anything can come good out of that. And he's like, hey, man, I don't know. I didn't know myself until I met him. Why don't you just come? Why don't you just come see it? Let him demonstrate to you, Nathaniel, who and what he is rather than me having to do it. He was probably just like, just like us. And, and because that's true, here's what we gotta, we've got to recognize a principle. Most of the time, Somebody trusts a Christian before they trust Christ. Most of the time, somebody trusts a Christian before they trust Christ. That's what happened with me. That's, that's how I came to know Christ. At the end of the day, dude, it was these two gals that me and my buddy started to trust. Like they were just intentional with us. They had us over for dinner and they were really trying to get us over to meet their friend Jesus. And as I trusted them, I began to listen to what they were saying. And, and instead of, you know, my, 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 my uh, rejections of the gospel began to just get weaker and weaker because, well, but I know, I know them and I like them and I feel like they're not trying to swindle me or, or, you know, trick me or anything. 
So what about you? Are you taking time as an owner to build relationships with others and invite them? Not, not, you know, some people feel pressure. Like you have to go door to door and you have to knock on people's door and you have to say, are you ready to receive Christ as your savior? I gotta tell you, man, good luck. If that's your thing, okay? Like I'm, I'm not trying to stop it, but for most of us, that doesn't go well, okay? Like it just doesn't even go well. Even if we do do it, it doesn't go well. Uh, for most of us, there's gotta be a level of trust first because before someone trusts Christ, they trust a Christian. So are you intentionally building into the lives of other people? Are you saying, hey man, I'll watch the kids, don't worry about it. Hey, can I bring you a coffee? How about that? Hey, can I, can I just embrace the ministry of small talk? Like sometimes, you know, you don't, I don't wanna do small talk. Why don't you just go do small talk anyway? Why don't you just do it for them so they begin to trust you? So that as you begin to pray and invite them, they might say yes. And, and that's why we, you know, sometimes we just need an opening. So you might invite them to church. And then, you know, hey man, hopefully they're, they're gonna encounter Jesus in some real way that is him toward them and not just you toward them. But sometimes we need, we need something a little bit easier. So I wanna show you these arrows on the screen. This is the strategy. We take the Connect class through this. I want you to understand what they're understanding. This is our whole how we do the thing where we turn uh, captives into worshipers. It starts there on your left with big day. A big day is like we just did last weekend, boobash. Or like we'll do on Christmas Palooza. That's the new big day we got coming up on December 18th, okay? It's just a big after church party, Christmas party. That's all that it is. But it's a thing that you can say, I can invite my neighbor to that and they might come to that quicker than they come to church. But also if they do come to that, they might be more willing to come the very next time to a Christmas Eve worship experience. There's just open doors. So, so maybe, uh, you know, they, they're, they're kid, kids, kids are a great deal, man. You can Anytime we do stuff for kids, like people like to do stuff for their kids even if they don't want to do it. So you invite their kids. Hey, can your kids come to the Boobash? Can your kids come to the Fall Festival? Can your kids come to the Christmas Palooza? And you're doing all this not to pressure them, just to ask them knowing that if the first time you ask them is for Christmas Eve, that's great, but that's just the first time you ask. And usually it takes about four or five asks before you're, probably, before you're finally going to in a sense, wear down their flesh, okay? There's just a reaction we all have. Like, I don't know, I don't want to do that. You know, but as we lovingly, as they trust you, and you keep, hey man, no big deal, but maybe you want to come along with me. Maybe we can all be like Philip and just invite Nathaniel. And maybe we need to be praying for those opportunities. Maybe we would say, God, would you just, I, I can't be responsible for the whole world. Would you just lay on my heart the people in my sphere who you want me to be intentional with? who you want me to regularly pray for so God works on their heart so it sounds like a good idea. Here's number two, church attendance. Church attendance is the second commitment of an owner, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. Here's a couple of reasons why church attendance is really important for owners. Because number one, we found out the content and information, like stuff we put out on social media, videos and blog posts and all that stuff, content and information does not make Christians. You know what makes Christians? Christians make Christians. That's how they're produced. Just like humans make humans, Christians make Christians. Now, Christians can use content. They, they can use blogs. They can send links. They can say, hey, man, check this out. This will, this will help you move along on your walk but it takes a community to actually create, to, to have life on life transfer of understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower. That takes actual Christians doing it. And you can't help anybody else if you're not here to do it. This, this one's gonna get prickly for a second, okay? Let me give you another one though first. Here's why, especially if you've got kids or grandkids, you need to be in church because your kids or grandkids are someday going to be adults and you want them to be adults of conviction that actually believe stuff, that are actually willing to take a moral stand about something. And if they're not trained morally, they will not get that, okay? That doesn't happen on Sesame Street. We can no longer trust anybody else to raise our kids to give them some kind of a character so they don't just roll over for the culture by the time they're an adult. There's gotta be something on the inside that says, no, dude, I learned better than that. I'm standing up. And you can't, it can't just be you. It's gotta be someone else, other older people that love them that come around and say, this is the way, walk in it. Your kids need that. If you want them to be adults of substance and all y'all adults, you know I'm telling the truth, so you might as well say amen really loud. Amen. And that can't happen if you're not here. 
but also not, not just for them, not just for the ones that we want to help, no, but for us ourselves. We need this book. We need this regularly poured in, not even just you know, perusing yourself and getting in from time to time. Listen, all week long, the enemy is using all of his stuff, all of his social media, all the stuff that you're around to try to really train your brain to think his way. That's what, that's what you're seeing on TV. That's what you're seeing in the movies. That's what you're seeing around the water cooler a lot of the time. And so if you think you can counteract that with one hour, if you even come, my friend, you're mistaken. That's not how it works. You need to fight that thing a little harder. You need some antibodies going after that virus. Um, there's, a, there's a movie released several years ago called Limitless. It had Bradley Cooper in it. And in this movie, for those of you who are familiar with this, okay, there's this drug that he finds. He, they, they kind of begin the movie. He's kind of like a dope kind of, okay, he's, he's not, not making much of himself. And he finds this NZT48. This is kind of like this miracle drug that nobody can get and yet it makes you really, really smart. Like it, it, in a sense, turns on your brain so that you're smarter than everybody. And it, it's, it's, you know, they're kind of like, oh, this is how smart everyone's supposed to be. And so he starts like really succeeding and moving forward. The problem is after about eight or 10 hours, everyone thinks he's brilliant and it wears off and you gotta take another pill. And so the whole story is about him trying to get more and more of these pills. In the story, NZT48 is not necessarily, it's, it's morally questionable, okay? But in the real world, my friends, this, let me introduce you. This is your NZT48, okay? After t eight or 10 or so hours, you gotta pour in some more. You gotta like, like that's what you gotta do in order to stay, here, here's what happens. When, when Bradley Cooper doesn't take the NZT48, he gets dumb. When we don't take that, oh dear heart, I'm sorry, you're dumber. You're dumber than you were, okay? You're not as discerning, you're not queuing in like you should. Go ahead and drink that, man. And you make sure you're drinking and making sure it's not just you, but it's actually pouring in. You gotta be in church in order to be able to do this. You can't take other people where you yourself are not. So it doesn't make any sense to be like, hey, I wanna invite you to church, come on, come on with me. And now do all the things they do, but I'll see you later. Like that, that's not how that's supposed to go. So let me have a, This is dangerous when I do this kind of thing, okay? So we're gonna have, for some, this is gonna be like a daddy talk, okay? Others of you, picturing your old man is gonna be bad, so don't picture him. Picture like a loving friend, okay? Picture the friend that's got your back. I'll like jump into a fight to defend you, but I'll also tell you where you're wrong, okay? So some of you, you are, you're so new to this thing. Like, you're just checking the things of Jesus out. I just gotta, I just gotta applaud you, hey. Way to go. Like, there's no expectation for you. This whole, we're like, we're so pumped that you're here at all or that you're watching at all. Like, j just know that we're all super ecstatic on the inside, okay? Others of you, you are taking steps. Like, you're doing, and, and, and I've, I've met, some of you have talked to you about this, okay, and I've, I've given you a high five. You are jumping into community. You're not waiting. You're not, like, waiting along the sides of the walls like the junior high dance. You're not just waiting. You're jumping in, okay? You're getting in. You're going to the Grove, and you're, you're trying stuff out. You're getting into serving. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All I want to do for you is just bravo, man. Way to go. You are crushing it. There's others of you who, you've been a Christ follower for a little while, and when it comes to the church attendance thing. I love you so much. You got to hear this gently. When it comes to the church attendance thing, dear heart, you're killing me. You're killing me. You're killing me because there's really no reason you shouldn't be in church every weekend unless you've got a job, unless you're on a trip, unless you're on a vacation, unless there's some other reason you can't be there. You should be there for them and for you. And because we just read in God's word, the major trick, the thing the devil's gonna talk everybody into is thinking, church is kind of take it or leave it, man. For those of you who are crushing it right now and you're, you're taking all these steps, can, can I lovingly encourage you about those ahead of you? You're gonna see some older Christians and you're gonna, they're gonna be really flippant with the idea of like, you gotta be in church and you gotta be absorbing God's word. I just gotta tell you, do not pick that up. I'm sure they're doing a lot of other stuff, right? Don't take that because they're way off. Like they're wrong. Here's how I know, because when you find out how really close they are to Jesus, how really close the spirit of God is moving in their life, they're often very conflicted because they're, yeah, they're, they're drinking up Jesus sometimes and then they're, they're just kind of like, I, I don't know. Did you know that Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God, seek it first. And I, I don't 
want to step on anybody's toes, but dude, this is what pastors do. We tell you what's true. And what's true is, dude, you should be in church all the time. You should be drinking. How are you going to get strong? You know, the biggest guys in the gym are there all the time. <laughs> like that's how that works. The guys that are growing in Christ, the guys and gals, it's because they prioritize being there. Now, some of you, I want to applaud you too, because you're doing that and, and, and you're loving it and you're bringing other people. And that's, that's awesome. I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody. I'm just trying to make you understand Guys, I don't know how I have to say it other than, oh, you're killing me, man. You're killing me. This is true. Yeah. To grow, you have to be present with the people of God. I heard some amens. <laughs> um, I feel like maybe some other people, you're going to get it. You're going like, to be driving home. You're like, you know, that preacher's right. Amen. And then you're going to go for it. <laughs> Number three, Bible-centered fellowship with other Christians. This kind of like builds on that one, but every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the prototype church. I know I'm, I'm jumping to different scriptures and I wish I had time to explain them all, but we don't. But here we have a picture of captives becoming worshipers in the context of community. And what's so awesome about this is up until this point, largely, People take solo steps. Like they decide to go to the big day. They decide, oh, yeah, I guess I'll just go. I'll go to church or whatever. And that's really hard to do on your own. When they do here, when they come here, when they get into fellowship, which is beyond a Sunday thing, they start to step together. They start to see, oh, church, going to church wasn't the point. That was just the catalyst to get me into actual Christian community. That was to get me into a place of health where I'm surrounded by life and it's flourishing. And my friends, one of the reasons this is so important is because history and just paying attention and the Bible will prove to you that isolatory Christians, dude, you are in danger, okay? You're, you're, you're target number one from the enemy's perspective. You're, you're, so, you're, you're almost out anyway. Like he's, he's try, just trying to beat you out. He's gonna start with deception. He's gonna try to trick you about some stuff. He'll be like, ah, that's not really an important thing. And you don't really need to worry about that. And then he's gonna come along and check this out. He's gonna get you offended. He's gonna get you pissed about something. And be like, oh, look what they did. And see, you don't have, but see, you don't have anybody around you. You don't have anybody else to con contradict that and tell you the truth. And once you get offended, oh baby, you're super easy. You're easy to just like, well, you know, forget about all this stuff. And after that offense ultimately comes a little bit down the road, disqualification. This is where you're just like, hey, um, the plan that God had for my life, forget that plan, I got my own plan. And, and by that time, we're deceived enough to just think we chose that when really we were set up by our spiritual enemy. My friends, you gotta embrace community just like I have to get on the treadmill. I don't like the treadmill, can I tell you? When I was 30 years old, I was like, crap. I probably need to start getting on the treadmill. I like to, I like to go to the gym, I like to work out, but the treadmill is, is my nemesis. But I started to go because I was like, you know, future Carter wants me to get on the treadmill now. And my kids' weddings want me to get on the treadmill now. Because I want to be here. Like, I don't want, like, if I have a heart attack, I want to just be kind of random, not because I participated in that some way. You know what I'm saying? So for future you, you got to embrace community. You got you to prioritize. And I, what does that mean? You got to hack some other stuff off in order to be able to do this well. Let's look at those four arrows again. So we had big day. Big day led to Sunday. And now we come into stuff like connect class and grow. This is really where, see right here, we're, we're together, but we're not getting to know one another. You know what happens at the Grove? The Grove is not a place. It's here. But it's a, it's a thing we do where we come together and we get in small groups and we learn how to study the Bible together. And you know how different it is? Right here, this is a one-way conversation largely. Most of you aren't going to argue with me right now. But when we're at the Grove on Wednesday nights, there's a circle and people, you know, there's multiple circles and people are talking about, here's what God's showing me in God's word. Here's what God's showing me. Here's what God's showing me. And the amount of truth and revelation that's shooting back and forth across the table, dude, it is dope. And it's breaking down strongholds in people's heart and they're getting free and they're getting, their eyes are opening to all kinds of stuff. Y'all know you Grovers should be saying, amen, the loudest, I think maybe. But whatever, whatever we gotta do, or for others, it's just connect class is the first step. That's where you first start to get in a little bit of a community. You see the strategy, you see what we're trying to do but it just becomes different when you're starting to cling to people. And my friend, that's a, that's a lifelong battle. You're gonna want to, most of us have this thing in our heart, we're pushing and pulling. I wanna be close to people, but people betray you, so get away from me. 
I want to be close to people, but I have these other important priorities. Yeah, hack that thing off, man. Quit pushing people away and just decide, I'm going to have to fight for this wise priority the rest of my life to stay in rich community. Thanks, E. I'm glad E likes it. Hopefully, there's some of you out there saying, so good, so good. We're almost there. Number four, personal prayer and Bible study. This is where it leaves just here, uh-oh, and goes between you and Jesus up here. See, one of my greatest fears as a preacher is that you're going to hear me and be like, oh, that was good. But when you go home, it's going to be really hard for you to connect with God. You'll be like, well, I think Carter does. No, don't, don't think about me at all. Think about Jesus and get in Jesus' presence. Listen, this is what uh, Paul said to Colossians. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not just a little baby bit. It wasn't a baby bit. Anybody, anyone's translation say baby bit? It doesn't. It says richly. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Here they are, prioritizing together in the word. And they're doing it because they can't give what they don't have. And my friends, we can't give what we don't have. We can't really be transformative agents in the world if we're not helping other people or if, if we're not ourselves being transformed by Christ. So here's, here's the vision. Here's, here's what we're doing in the Grove right now. We did it last semester. We're, we're like figuring this out as, as we get good at this. We're, we're tuning this in. Uh, the Grove has become, it's kind of become like a little school thing, okay? But in a good Jesus relational way. Start with learn how to study the Bible. We did that last summer and this semester. Next semester, we'll do how to study the Bible for those who haven't been through that and how to have a potent, powerful, rich prayer life. And we'll cook that for a little while. And then we'll go into another semester, we'll add another class. And then we'll add another class. And, and I want you to envision with me, in the middle of the week, this place is packed. This place is full with people growing richly in the word, the prioritizing fellowship. It's not just a one-way hearing stuff there. They're in it. They've got accountability partners. They're doing life together. They're battling devils. They're slapping demons off one another's shoulders. They're ready and they're watching their kids absorb all this and learn, this is how you do life. This is the way, walk in it. That's the vision. That's what we're trying to do long-term. That's gonna take an army of people that say, yes, Lord. Oh, I could go home and watch something that I could watch any other night on Netflix, or I could go make sure this thing happens for the sake of not just my kids, not just for the sake of me, but for the sake of the captives that need to come and become worshipers. That's for whom? Number five, serving at church. We're going to the next two together. Let's see that, that image one more time, those arrows. So you went from big days to Sunday. This is, this is the strategy. This is how we do it. Connect class, the Grove. Those two are about uh, learning in community. And then serve, give, invite. This is the final examples of worship that the New Testament calls us to. Romans 12, 6 says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. I want you to see the order there. Since we have gifts, so if you're in the body of Christ, you have talents, you have uh, passions, you have things that you're really, really good at, and here's what you might sometimes forget, that is a gift to you and it is a gift not just for you. Those are your gifts, but they're not just for you. Because what did he say? He said, since you have them and they're all different, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. You have the gift. Now, I've graciously given it to you. Now exercise it. I gave it so you could do something with it. You have it. Now I want you to do something with it. And what he wants us to do is super clear right in God's word. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, the context is, is spiritual gifts. He says, you yourself, since you're eager for manifestation of the spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Your gifts are not for you. They're for the building up of the body of Christ to turn captives into worshipers. That's what they're for. And if that's what they're for, it's not that you can't benefit from them, but God wants us to want what he wants. And what he wants is for us to exercise them for the building up of the body of Christ. Let me give you an example. This isn't a real example, but let's just pretend it is for a second. Let's say I give one of my daughters pizza money. I say, hey man, here's some pizza money. Mom and dad, we're going out for a little while. I need to make sure the kids eat tonight. So would you order pizza? Here's the money you're gonna use. You're gonna feed the rest of the kids, okay? Now, if, it, if we came to find out that, well, she didn't really get pizza for everybody. She ordered pizza, but had it snuck through the back door, went up to her room and ate all the pizza and the other kids didn't even eat it at all. You could imagine, though, I love my daughter and I wanted her to enjoy some of the pizza, 
my intent was that everybody ate. My intent was that she would take what I gave her and give it away so that everybody could eat. Are we seeing this yet? Are we seeing this? You've been given gifts, not just so you can go up in your room and like, I love these gifts, but so that you could distribute them. You could distribute your energy. You could distribute your talents. You could distribute your stuff to other people so that they could grow, so that they could be fed, so that they could progress. Christianity without responsibility is meaningless. And that's what ownership's about. It's about responsibility. It's about saying, the New Testament actually requires some things of me. And I need to make sure that I'm after it. Here's the final one, sacrificial systemic giving, systematic giving. Sacrificial systematic. Here's something that, that giving does that nothing else on the, world, on the earth can do. It earth proofs your heart. When we give stuff away, it earth proofs our heart. Meaning our heart, just like we talked about at the beginning, it just grabs onto stuff. It's like, I want this. And, and I'm tied down to earthly things. And I want this earthly going. I want that earthly object. And this is my stuff. And I worked really hard to get all my stuff. So don't nobody take my stuff. Not knowing that this is the very stuff you're going to leave. Investing in here, dude, all of this is good. You cannot take any of it with you. Even if you leave some of it to your kids, how do you know they're gonna use it for anything good at all? What if they spend it on stupid, ungodly, ridiculousness and you're in heaven being like doggone why did i do that i could have invested now matthew 6 19 do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also some of you are old enough to know that that is a day coming soon that's coming it comes fast man i can't believe i'm already halfway to 90. what i was 22 a minute ago like it is happening, dude. We've only got so long to say, I do not want to just invest here. I want to enjoy the stuff. I want to eat the pizza, but I don't want to invest here. I want to make sure I drag as many captives out and into becoming worshipers as I possibly can. I was at a church a couple years ago. It's, it's a buddy's church. I love the guy. I love his church. He showed us his children's ministry, my friends. And it was, it was alarming. It, 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 I was like, bro, I would never, ever bring my kids here. Like, because for some reason, I'm, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's in the thinking sometimes in churches, but Christians think, hey man, if it's Christian, that's good enough. Can I challenge you to, we, we should love people better than that. Hey, well, you know, what, 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 what can we say? We're Christians, it's good enough. I never want to say that. I want to say, hey, I'm content. This is what God gives us. But I always want to be saying, what else could we do to demonstrate to these people God loves them and we prepared for them and we thought about them and we wanted, we wanted to make sense in their head because we have the answer and part of that answer is us growing in generosity. If you've been, if you've been doing this for a long time, I mean, just ask yourself the question, am I still growing in generosity? I've been a Christian this much longer. Have I grown that much more generous? That's a super legit question given who's, whose servant you are. He gave away everything. So, my friends, we have the answer. It is, it is God's word. It is for us to carry this and free the captives with it and turn them in to worshipers. We're gonna go to our offering right now here in the middle of this point, okay? So you guys know, uh, if, if you're brand new with us, we don't expect you to give, but if you're an owner and you're somebody who you're like, this is on me, then I wanna encourage you, man, give as the spirit is leading you and sometimes it's, Believe him when he's leading you to a little bit more and go ahead and invest in heaven. We're investing in captives getting free. You can give all the normal ways. You can go online. You can do it anytime now when I'm talking or when the song is. Whenever it is though, I wanna challenge you. We've gotta be growing in sacrificial giving if we're really gonna see captives set free. Here's the other options. Here's what we could do. We could do none of this He's like, ah, it's for somebody else to invite. I'm not gonna be inviting. And we can be confused and wonder why. Man, why are we growing so like irrelevant? Why are we shriveling up like old prunes? Why does nobody, you know, wanna come hang out with us anymore? We could just be, we could cater to the, the gods of our feelings. And say, well, I'll just respond whenever I feel like it. I'll just go to church when I feel like it. And then we can wonder why the great love of the body of Christ is growing cold. And we're like, where are my friends? 
I don't have anybody to do battle with me. We can say, hey, it's for somebody else to know the scriptures and teach them to me. Or we can say, I'm gonna personally walk deeply with Jesus and I'm gonna prioritize communal learning of God's word in such a way that I know him and I can pass on what I know to other people. Or we could just say, nah, forget about it. It don't matter. We could take our gifts and we could squander them. We just bury them in the sand and be like, hey, somebody else, dude, somebody else's time. I got my life to live right now. And then we could wonder, why doesn't God trust me with anything? Because of what you did with the pizza money, that's why. We could all just say, I'm generous enough and Jesus never wants me to expand in that area ever. You could say that. And I would tell you, far fewer people will be reached through that attitude than if we all just said, God, well, I'm gonna take God at his word. I trusted him to save me, so I'll trust that he's telling me the truth about that I cannot give him. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna challenge some of you, every one of you that feels the spirit burning in your heart about this, Hey man, I'm asking you to own it because the Bible asks you to own it. It's, it's really not about this church as much as live an authentic Christian life committed to this church. That's, that's what it is. And you can do that a number of ways. You can fill out the card on your chair. There's a, there's a link on the card too that you can just go online. That's the best way to do it. Do it now, do it during the song, do it sometime today. But we want to fight these battles with you. This is you saying, I'm in, I'm all in. Put me on the team, it's Super Bowl year. I wanna do this thing. We're gonna sing a song and I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna be ready for prayer for anybody that wants prayer. You just come up and I'll pray with you. Especially about any of the six things we just said. Some of you, you're like, you're high-fiving somebody because you're like, I'm crushing that thing. Others of them though, you're like, I I'm not doing well here. Come pray with me. I'll pray with you. I promise it'll be friendly. It won't be mean. But we'll get the power of God on that thing or anything else that you need prayer about today. Let me pray. God, I thank you for a high call. Jesus, I thank you that um, you don't call us to be subhumans. You call us to be spirit-filled humans. I pray that you would help each one of us take steps, take our next steps into becoming better worshipers ourselves so that we can help captives become worshipers as well. God, all this stuff would not be possible without the Holy Spirit, so we ask that you would really do it through us. But I pray for conviction. I pray for fire. I pray for, I pray against a lackadaisical attitude or a spirit of compromise with this world. God, help us to live like we're leaving. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just wanna make space to respond to that, to sit with the Lord and ask 